Turn with me to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 17, Revelation chapter 17. It was in eighth grade that I learned a harsh reality of life. Things are not always what they seem to be. I was in New York on a school trip. It was a historical studies tour, and we were touring the East Coast, and we made our way to New York, and we had a little bit of a a stop there to enjoy the sights and sounds and incredible diversity of smells that are in New York. And it was uh, very cold. We were going out, we were shopping. It was cold. I hadn't prepared my wardrobe, which should come as no surprise to any of you. I was freezing, and so I decided I'd buy a, a beanie. I decided I'd go down on the streets, buy a beanie, a little ski cap to keep my head warm because I was freezing cold. And as I was walking on the streets, there was a very kind gentleman who offered me a Nike beanie, and uh, shockingly, it was only $10 or whatever I had in my pockets. And so I had $3, and he said, that works, and I gave him 3 bucks, and I got a Nike beanie for $3 the, the, the little swoosh on it looked a little different, but that's okay. As I, as I turned it over and looked on the back, the back said Noki on it, as in N-O-K-E, instead of Nike, as in N-I-K-E. I just thought, that must be a misprint. Oh, well. And when I went back to my teacher, I said, look at this amazing purchase. I bought a genuine Nike beanie for three bucks. He just laughed. He said, uh, that's not real. You know that, right? That's not a real Nike beanie. That's what's called a knockoff. I said, knockoff? What's that? And he proceeded to tell me that it was a substitute and a very cheap one for the actual, genuine, authentic, real Nike beanie. And since that day, I've been cynical of everything and everyone, right? Like, thanks, New York City. You lied to me. Why do we fall for these cheap substitutes? Why are some people like myself duped by these knockoffs. Some people, they know they're a knockoff and they're absolutely fine because it's cheaper, but it looks the same, unless it says Noki on the back. (laughs) That's a fair question to ask when it comes to economic things, when it comes to products that we might buy, but what about when it comes to God? What about when it comes to religious things? Why are so many people quick to turn to cheap substitutes when the real God of the universe is there pleading with them to come to him. And he's better by far than any substitute that's out there. Why do so many people buy into the cheap substitutions that are out there? Well, I think we're going to find some of the answers here this morning in this very, very strange passage before us in Revelation 17 and 18, probably two of the harder chapters in the Bible to understand. Definitely challenging to apply, but I think that as we dive deep into it, I think that it will make complete sense to our understanding, and we will be able to apply it very, very easily this morning. We're just going to look at seven verses this morning. So Revelation chapter 17, starting in verse 1. Let's read together. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality, and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. And he carried me away in the spirit and into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls having in her hand a a gold cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her immorality. And on her forehead, a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drink, drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered greatly And the angel said to me, why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. Father, we come to a passage like this, and it would seem at first glance that uh, not only is this very strange and difficult to interpret, but also probably doesn't have much relevance to us today. And God, every time we've come 
to your word, especially in the book of Revelation during our study of this book, every time we've thought that, we have been profoundly amazed as we have seen ourselves in these verses. I pray that you would do that wondrous miracle again this morning. Give us the gift of illumination to see ourselves in these verses, to see, yes, what these verses mean, but then what that meaning means for us. I pray that you would quicken our spirits, sober our minds. We live in a world in which the harlotries of this woman are rampant. And so I pray that you would sober our minds, prepare our hearts even now for the days ahead in which the immoralities of this woman would become even more rampant. Holy Spirit, We ask it every Lord's Day because we need it every Lord's Day. Please open our eyes to behold wonderful things from your law. Apart from you opening our eyes to see, we will not understand what this text means. So Spirit, be our guide. Point us to Jesus. And may he be our soul's satisfaction this day. We pray in his name. Amen. Three main questions. As we come to this text, there are different ways that you could outline it, but I just want to ask three questions and walk through the text. And as we walk through it, Lord willing, we answer these questions. Question number one, who is this woman? Question number two, what is her purpose? And question number three, why is John astonished? So number one, who is this woman? Number two, what is her purpose? And number three, why is John astonished? So let's start with the first one. Who is this woman? We'll we'll see a lot of her in verses one through five. And by the way, next week, Lord willing, we will finish the rest of chapter 17 as the angel himself, you saw it in verse seven, he gives us a fullness of the explanation of who this woman is. But even before we get there, we can start to understand who she is and what she's all about here in these first seven verses. So who is this woman? You remember, we just saw the devastating judgment that God has poured out through these seven bowls onto the entirety of the whole earth. This is in the end times. This is in Daniel's 70th week. This is yet to come. This is a seven year period. The beginning of which the first three and a half years is bad, but it could be worse. The last three and a half years, the great tribulation is awful. It's the worst time in all of human history. Jesus himself says, unless those days are shortened, no one would live through those days. Jesus has to cut those days short just so that humans can still exist. So we saw this devastating judgment. If you go back to chapter 16, verse 19, it says that the great city was split into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and Babylon the great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. So Babylon receives the wine of the fierce wrath of God. Babylon is being judged and Babylon's being judged by these seven bold judgments that are the worst judgments that history has ever seen. And so the question might be, Are these judgments valid? Are they a little bit too much? Why are these judgments given? And I believe that chapter 17 and 18 is the answer to that question. John is given a vision so that there will be no doubt in his mind that the judgment that Babylon is about to receive is altogether deserved. So we're going back in time a little bit in chapter 17 and 18 to to show us who Babylon is, what Babylon's done, and why she is deserving of the punishment that she is getting in the bowl judgments. By the way, that tells us something right off the bat. God does not end chapter 16 and then just move straight to chapter 19 with the second coming, though that is chronologically what's going to happen next. He doesn't just go straight to the battle of Armageddon. He gives us an explanation for why the judgments are happening. I think that that is so relevant to us today. God in his grace does not say, She deserves the judgments, just take my word for it. He says, let me explain it to you. I want you to understand why she's deserving of the judgments. We might have the question in our mind, mind, is this this just? Is this okay? Is this righteous? Is this a valid response of God? And God's going to say, let me show you why it is instead of just trust me. I think that's so helpful for us in so many areas of life. He's giving us the reason why. He wants us to see why. Just like, you know, Jesus in the upper room when Thomas had said, I'm not going to believe unless I see his side, unless I put my, my finger in the nail prints or the, the, the spear in the side, I, I'm not going to believe. Jesus doesn't show up and say, how dare you say that? You should have just believed. He says, hey, whatever you need, man. You, you need my hands? You need my side? Here I am. Touch me. I'll, I'll help you to believe. Whatever you need to believe, I will help you. 
The Bible says that our God is light. He's in the light. He's not hard to find. He's trying to make himself known to us. And so here he is doing that, even with the judgments that we're seeing. So verse one, the uh, angel, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, we don't know which bowl this angel had, but he comes to John and he says, come here, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. If you drop down to verse 15, you don't have to even speculate as to what those waters are because the angel says, the waters which you saw where, where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So somehow this harlot sits on all of the world, on the whole of the people that are there. She has influence and impact at, in every level, at every turn. She's universal in her influence. That's what the the symbol here of sitting on many waters. She's universal in her influence. And then verse two, the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality and those those who dwell on the earth, we know that phrase, that those who dwell on the earth, non-believers were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. So you have a picture. There's a picture that John is, is receiving, this vision that John is getting of this woman who is a prostitute and she works with not only the kings as some of her main clients, but every single person in the world, every non-believer in the world. And what she does, and the reason why this is a picture of prostitution, is we see this vision of making people drunk to steal things from from them. This was a common practice in Rome at that time, where a prostitute would uh, have somebody that uh, would call upon her, and uh, she would go to the person, um, and then she would get that person drunk, so that that person would, would fall asleep, would be drunk, and she could steal everything from that person. That's the imagery here, that she's just taking. She's stealing everything. And she's doing it with everybody. She's stealing from everyone. She has great influence, and she's stealing from everyone. Verse 3. He carried me away in the spirit to a wilderness. We don't know what wilderness this is. This could be a literal physical wilderness, and we'll talk about this more next week. But I do think that this is more than likely an allusion back to Isaiah 21, verse 1, and Isaiah 21, verse 9. We're not going to turn there. You can just write it down. But in Isaiah 21, verse 1, uh, if you start with Isaiah 21, verse 9, that's where we saw earlier, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. That's That's a prophecy in Isaiah 21, verse 9, that God said, Babylon is ultimately going to fall. Babylon's not going to stand. Babylon's going to fall. Fallen, fallen is Babylon. And the angel quoted that in chapter 14, that Babylon had fallen. So I believe that this wilderness, if you go to Isaiah 21, verse 1, it talks about being in a wilderness, making this prophecy about the fall of Babylon. I think that that's why this wilderness is here to remind John, oh, the prophecy was there. Babylon's going to fall and this is God doing it. This is the way that God makes Babylon fall. In the wilderness, verse 3, he sees a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. Now, beast, we we know that we've come across two beasts, the Antichrist and the false prophet. But once we see that this beast is full of blasphemous names, that was depicting the Antichrist, and having seven heads and ten horns, that's identical to the beast that we saw in chapter 13, verse 1. So this is the Antichrist. She's sitting on the Antichrist. Remember, seven heads is a reference to those seven nations, those seven empires that all hated God's people. You go all the way back to Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, the Persians, the the, um, Greeks, the Romans, those, those six, and then that seventh, the kingdom yet to come, that future kingdom of the Antichrist. And ten horns has to do with the ten kings that are there in the end times in this geopolitical system that all rule with the Antichrist in this one world government. So we've seen this before. We've seen this beast. This is the Antichrist. We've never seen the beast described as a scarlet beast. We don't know why it's scarlet. Maybe it's royalty because he's king over the world at this point. Could be. It could also be sin, right? Just could be he's filled with sin. The antithesis to Jesus, who's going to come back with a a glowing white robe. That's going to ultimately be uh, dipped in the blood of his enemies. It could also refer to that. It could be scarlet because it's the blood of all the martyrs who have died. He has killed these saints. We don't know, but we do know that this is the Antichrist. So this woman is sitting on the Antichrist. So this is really important to know. The fact that the woman is riding this beast is, and it's not the beast itself. So she is separate from the beast. She's different from the beast. 
She represents a power distinct from the Antichrist. And she's supported by the Antichrist, but she also controls the Antichrist. She's supported by the Antichrist because she's riding the Antichrist. She's riding this beast. Think of a horse. You're not going to be able to move quickly if you're not riding the horse. So she is helped by the Antichrist. But without that bridle in the horse's mouth, the horse isn't going to know where to go. So she controls and supports. There's this weird symbiotic relationship that's happening. And in the end of chapter 17, you're going to see it all just get thrown to bits. Verse 4, we see her apparel, garments of royalty and prosperity. She was clothed in purple and scarlet. We see her, number two, her adornment. She's wearing gold. She's adorned with gold. Literally, uh, she is made gold with gold. In the Greek, it's made gold with gold. So she is just adorned. Uh, One translation says she's decked out. And she is. She's decked out in gold. She has precious stones. She has pearls. Number three, we see her abomination. So we see her apparel, her adornment, and her abominations. She's, she has this golden cup full of abominations of all the unclean things of her immorality. And that doesn't necessarily only mean sexual immorality. That is the, the picture here. She's a, a harlot. She's a prostitute. And her acts of immorality are a picture of spiritual idolatry and adultery, which obviously would include sexual immorality, but it's more than that. In verse 5, on her forehead, a name was written. Now, this could be similar to the name that's written on believers who are sealed by God. This could be similar to a name that's written on non-believers who are sealed by the Antichrist. It also could be, again, the, the imagery from a prostitute back in Roman days who would literally have like a name tag uh, written on a band that she would wear. So it could be that. What is the name? Uh, The name is a mystery. The Greek is abundantly clear that mystery is attached to uh, the name being mysterious, not her name actually being mystery. Some some of your Bibles might say her name is Mystery Babylon. That's a misunderstanding of the Greek text. The Greek is very clear. Her name is mysterious, but what her name is is not mystery. Her name is a mystery, but her name is Babylon the Great. That's her name. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. She has a name, literally in the Greek, it's a name written, which is a mystery, which is Babylon the Greek. Mystery. What's a mystery? Mystery in the Bible is a word that refers to something that was concealed, but now is being revealed. Something that we didn't fully understand, but now we're understanding. That's what's happening here. This isn't mystery like Sherlock Holmes trying to uh, crack a case. This is mystery as in something that was enshrouded that didn't fully, you couldn't fully understand it until progressive revelation showed it to us. Marriage is a mystery, right? Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says that marriage is a mystery because God invented it and created it and designed it way back in eternity past. And in his mind, it's designed to be a picture of Christ and the church. We didn't really understand that until Christ came, died on the cross, bought the church with his own blood. We didn't really fully get that. And that's why Paul says it was, it was concealed, but now it's been revealed. We understand what it is. So that tells us, by the way, the fact that her name is, is mysterious, that who she is is mysterious. That tells us that she has existed long before Daniel's 70th week because she existed in a way that was concealed and now is being revealed. So that's helpful for us. Some people put her only in Daniel's 70th week, only in the tribulation, only in those seven years. I think she's going to come to complete fruition in the seven years, but she's existed way before then. We see that she's a mystery. We also see that she's a mother. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. So she's a mother. She represents what began long ago and what is continuing till today. Where did it begin? Well, her name is Babylon, which actually comes from Babel. So the very beginning of this woman's reign and rule as a prostitute in the world is back in Babel, Genesis 10 and 11. We don't have time to turn there. You can write it down, Genesis 10 and 11. You guys remember the Tower of Babel? Remember the guy who founded that city? His name is Nimrod, so you know it's going to be a great city. Uh, Nimrod had a wife. Nimrod's wife was named Semiramis. 
she designed a cultic false religion, false practice. Some of this is extra biblical, uh, outside of the Bible that we know through tradition that she started these things. Some of it's in the Bible because she had a son and her son's name was Tammuz, which by the way, if you're having a boy anytime soon, Tammuz is a great name, named Tammuz. She had a son, her name was Tammuz. She claimed that Tammuz was uh, conceived through miraculous means, kind of a, a virgin birth idea. She also claimed that Tammuz was the promised child that was given to Eve. So Eve was promised that there's going to come somebody from your lineage that's going to bring the world back into peace and prosperity and uh, save us from the reign of evil. And she said, that's my kid. That's my son. And so he was worshipped and she was worshipped. And we actually see this. This is the Bible portion. Uh, some of this is extra biblical, but Ezekiel chapter 8 verse 14 talks about the worship of Tammuz. Talks about it as a false religion. Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 18 and Jeremiah chapter 44 verses 17 through 19 talk about Nimrod's wife as the queen of heaven. She exalted herself as the queen over all heaven. So all this to say, back in Babel, we have Nimrod. And you remember Nimrod's goal, he, he explicitly states it. The whole point of Babel was to make a city and a name. The whole point was to make a city, this enormous economic system that can flourish without God's help. We don't need God. And the name is to glorify ourselves. A religious system that we can promote ourselves, we can believe whatever we want to believe because we're king, we're God and not God. That's why they're creating a tower that reaches up into the heavens. Number one, let's get away from the earth because the last time that God destroyed the world, he did it with a flood. And so let's get away from the earth so that God can't flood us. Number two, let's reach all the way into the heavens so that we can find this God and kill him and reign as God. Nimrod's making a city and a name, a city and a name. And you need to know those two things because that's going to come up in chapter 18 that these earth dwellers are trying to make for themselves a city and a name. You also need to know Babel because Nimrod's wife decides to make a false religious system that existed all the way into the early BCs or the later BCs, if you will, all the way towards the end of uh, Zechariah even. Zechariah chapter 5 verses 1 through 11 describe Babylon as an evil woman. And so Babel begins in Genesis chapter 10, this this idea of false religion, false idols, false uh, spiritual adultery. And then you actually have a Neo-Babylonian period where you have Nebuchadnezzar who sets up that statue, worship the statue, worship me. Every form of religious, uh, false religious ideology, uh, idolatry and uh, ideology, there's a, a massive pull all the way back in Genesis chapter 10 to take us to the foundation of where this all began. When did it set up? When was it established? That's what John is seeing. So I think we have enough information at this point to answer the first question. Who is this woman? She is yet to come. She is future, but she's already existed. And she's here now. She's the epitome of spiritual fornication, adultery, and idolatry. She reaches all the way back to Babel and she reaches all the way forward to the very end of human history. Revelation 17 and 18, as we're going to see, is about a final world religion and world economic system. But Revelation 17 is also making it very clear that this woman is defining the very heart and essence of every false religion down through all of human history. So this woman represents, here is the definition of who this, this harlot of Babylon is. She represents the system of global false religion that has existed throughout the ages and will culminate in the seven-year period of time in the end times, Daniel's 70th week. She represents the system of global false religion. All false religions find their conception in who this woman is. That's why she's called a mother. She has given birth to every false religion that's out there. Again, that tells us that she doesn't only exist in the end times. She does exist in the end times, but not only in the end times, because she has been giving birth to false religion after false religion after false religion. So she represents global false religious systems that have existed all throughout the ages, but will culminate in the last seven years of human history. We even see that in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13. Uh, Peter wrote down that Babylon is a, a word for Rome, the Roman corrupt system of false 
idol worship towards Caesar and a, an economic system that's set up against God. So he even says, he, he refers to Babylon and people living in Babylon, but he refers to that, uh, that name by describing what Rome is using a, a term that everyone would have known. Babylon means to be in exile. Babylon means to be under a corrupt economic system and a corrupt political and religious system. So who is this woman? She is the representation of every false religious system that's ever existed and ever will exist. She's given birth to all of them. By the way, that's why she deserves the judgment that she's going to get. If anyone had any question as to the validity of God's judgment, just realize he's judging someone who has birthed every false religion that's ever existed in the entirety of humanity. No wonder she deserves such a terrible judgment. Question number two, what's her purpose? What's her purpose? We saw it already a little bit because this idea of being a prostitute or being a harlot, she's, this is Old Testament terminology. This is terminology from the Old Testament that was very clear. Israel was in a covenant relationship with God. Israel was in a covenant relationship with God, with Yahweh as their husband. And Israel, you, you were born into that system. You were born ethnically into a covenant relationship with God. Now you could choose to live according to it or not according to it, but that's how you were born into that system. That's why if you were born as an Israelite in the Old Testament to follow any other God, God says that's adultery, that's spiritual adultery. Very interesting to note, by the way, when we get to the New Testament, you're not born a Christian, right? You're not born into the covenant community of Jesus now. You're brought into it through baptism, through believing the gospel, when you are uh, old enough to understand and submit your, your life to Jesus. So it's very interesting because in the New Testament, the main terminology that's used to speak of wandering after other gods and not submitting to God is no longer adultery, though it is used in the New Testament. Now it's prostitution. Because you're not covenant keeping marriage with God in a spiritual relationship out of, you know, being born, right? You're not in a covenant relationship with God through birth, the way that you were as an Israelite in the Old Testament. So already we have an understanding of this woman's purpose because this woman's purpose is to set up false religions to steal you away from Yahweh, to steal you away from God. And if she can allure you and if she can seduce you and if she can bring you to herself, and to deny God, that's fine. She's done what she wanted to do. If she can't, verse 6, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. If she can't get you to turn, she'll kill you. It's very interesting. Uh, blood of the saints and blood of the witnesses of Jesus. I think this isn't explicit. But I think that's a reference to Old Testament saints and New Testament believers. So again, I think we have a clue here that this woman doesn't just exist during the seven-year period of you know, the end times, the seven-year period of tribulation. I don't think that that's the case. She existed long before that because she existed in the Old Testament. She was killing Old Testament believers, Old Testament saints. What's her purpose? Her purpose is to take you away from God any way she can. She loves it. She loves it. She's drunk on it. She's drunk with the blood. She, she enjoys it. She loves, this is what she wakes up in the morning longing to do. Reading a biography right now on Ulysses S. Grant, Robert E. Lee, the counterpart in the Civil War, said after the victory at Fredericksburg, he said this, quote, it is well that war is so terrible for we should grow too fond of it. It's a good thing that war is awful or else we would enjoy doing this. She doesn't think that martyrdom is awful. She loves doing this. She's getting drunk on killing believers. So, what's her purpose? Well, if we go back to verse 3, she's sitting on the beast. So she's working with the beast. They have a united purpose. They're trying to do the same thing. And very simply, they're trying to take people away from Jesus. What is her purpose? Her purpose is to get you away from Jesus any way that she can. That's her purpose. Who is she? She's the false religious system that's been existing all the way back to Genesis 10 with Babel and then all the way forward to the end times. What's her purpose? She just wants to get you away from God. Don't believe in Jesus, believe in something else. And if you do believe in Jesus, I want to kill you and I want to make it so awful that you'll deny Jesus. That's her goal. 
That's the Antichrist's goal. That's the false prophet's goal. Worship the Antichrist or else we're going to kill you. Worship the Antichrist and take his mark or else you can't buy or sell in our economy. We want to make life awful for you because we want to make it easy for you to uh, ally yourself with and align yourself with the Antichrist. The goal is very clearly and simply to take people away from Jesus, either by political might that the Antichrist have, and she's using that. She's, she's controlling the Antichrist. She's being supported by the Antichrist. She's sitting on the beast, so she's using this. Maybe political might's going to bring you away from God. Maybe brute force is going to bring you away from God. Persecution, suffering, killing. Or maybe it's just sed- seductive false religion. We see the exact same thing in play today. Some places it's incredibly dangerous to be a Christian. Some places it's just too easy to be a Christian. So people aren't Christians either way. I'm not going to be a Christian because it's too dangerous. Or I'm going to be a nominal Christian, but I'm not really going to be a Christian because it doesn't cost me anything. Satan's counterfeits have appeared in many countries and cultures, and they will reach their climax of sinister methods and evil practices and deceptive teachings here in Daniel's 70th week. She represents spiritual adultery, which again, that was depicted in the apostasy of Israel. Ezekiel 16 describes Israel as as a prostitute, uh, as as one who is um, allowing prostitutes to, to seduce her. All of Hosea is all about that. All false religions are essentially the same. They all begin at the Tower of Babel. So, who is this woman? She's the representation of all false religions and false religious systems over the entirety of humanity. What is her goal? Her goal is to take people away from God. And that's why John is writing this. That's why Jesus has given us this revelation because what John is wanting to do, you and I can be seduced by false religion. You can be seduced by this woman. And what John is wanting to do is break that magic spell of seduction. If you're seduced this morning, these words are written to break you free from seduction, from spiritual seduction. That leads us to our third question. Why is John so astonished? End of verse six. When I saw her, I wondered greatly. I wondered. Literally in Greek, it's I I wondered with wondering, or I was astonished with astonishment. It's both words put together. Completely astonished. Why? Why? Why is he so astonished? It's not that he doesn't understand what he's seen. He understands. This isn't a word for perplexed. This is a word for your mouth gaping open at the reality of what you're seeing. The angel says in verse 7, I'm going to tell you why. Why do you wonder? Not Again, not perplexed. I'm going to tell you about the mystery. I'm going to give you the unfolding of what's going on and give you the fullness of it. And we're going to look at that, Lord willing, next Sunday. The angel answers with such clarity any questions we might have, and it's very, very helpful. But John is astounded for several reasons. I don't think we can pin one, and honestly, there isn't one in the text. I think there are several reasons why. He has seen the fact that false religion has been going on for this long, and all the different tributaries of false religion all stem from the same source. That's astonishing. Even the ones that disagree. There's false religions out there that diametrically oppose other false religions. Your religion's wrong. Your religion's wrong. We hate you. We hate you. And John's seeing, oh, they're all working together. There's a demonic influence behind all of it. There's a satanic reason why they all exist. There's one mother that's given birth to all of these things. I think he's astonished at the fact that judgment is is going to come. I think he's wondering at the reality that judgment is coming and he realizes, oh, this is why that judgment's happening. Maybe he, like you and me, after reading chapter 16, says, man, this is a lot of judgment. Is this really worth it? And now we see, oh, I, I know why. I know why God is judging the way that he is. Maybe he's wondering at the death of his own brothers and sisters. He sees that she enjoys it. She's drunk on their death. But I think we got to go back to where we began our time this morning. In light of who this woman is, in light of everything she stands for, in light of how she seduces people and then destroys them, I think he's amazed. Why would anyone settle for following her? Why would anybody settle for such a cheap substitute? I think he's astounded by the corruption of Christianity. 
I think he's astounded by the, the seduction of false religion. Why does anybody believe this? I know who God is. I know what the gospel is. Why does anybody think anything other than him is attractive? And it's very easy to read this section and pat ourselves on the back and think of how good we are and how bad false religion is and how thankful that we are that we're not in false religion. It's very easy to say, look at us, we're great. But brothers and sisters, we need to see ourselves in this text. Just the very sheer fact that the Bible says that we still, as believers, can commit spiritual adultery. We still, as believers, can prostitute ourselves with other spiritual lovers. And I believe that there are four very clear and deadly allurements that we see in this text that would even try to seduce you and take you away from Jesus. Allurement number one. What are the dangerous allurements that the world is going to try and offer to seduce you, to make you think that the cheap substitute is better than the real thing? Allurement number one, the allurement of prestige. The allurement of prestige. Notice in verse two, the kings of the earth commit acts of immorality with her. They'll do whatever she says. They'll follow whatever she says. And so I think some Christians... Nominal Christians, Christians in quotation marks, I think some people say, well, we want to be famous too. We want to have prestige too. We don't want to be outsiders in the world. We want to look good. We want to be a part of impacting the culture. We want to be a part of, uh, you know, the, the, the policies and the politics. We don't want to be looked at as second-class citizens. We'd love to be friends with the world. And my friends, James chapter 4 is very clear. Friendship with the world is enmity towards God and James says, those who are friends with the world are spiritual adulterers. Yes, the church is called to affect its culture. Absolutely. Matthew chapter 5, we are a city on a hill that's supposed to shine brightly. But that truth, that reality is prostituted when we acquiesce to political or religious power, prestige, where we think we can get our foot in the door, we'll compromise a little bit, and we want, we want the accolades of the world. So many people do this in so many different ways. And I think people do it here, even in the end times. In verse 2, we see the kings that are doing this, and so everybody else is following along. Well, they're doing it, and we want to be like them. We want power like they have power. Allurement number two, the allurement of prosperity. The allurement of prosperity. Maybe prestige or fame or positions of power might allure you away from Jesus. Maybe it's prosperity. A lot of people follow after false religions in order to get rich. Notice verse 4, she is wearing purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. Has a gold cup. She has a lot of money. Religion is a very, very big business. And she bears a certain economic allure. And by the way, we're going to see this in chapter 17. We're going to look at Babylon mainly as a religious system. Chapter 18, we're going to look at Babylon mainly as a political economic system. So we've got a pious Babylon and a political Babylon. We have an ecclesiastical Babylon and an economic Babylon. And so here we're looking mainly at religious Babylon, but religion uses the economy, the economic allure, wealth and prosperity can become a basis for the allurement of false religion. Some people are drawn to false religion because they think it'll make them prosperous. They think that they'll get rich. It's not wrong to be rich. Please hear me clearly. It's not wrong to be rich. Go make a billion dollars and buy a church building for us. Awesome. It's not wrong to be rich. It's wrong to desire with greed to be rich. That's where it's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 11 says that that kind of greed, in fact, turn there. You need to see it. That kind of greed is so deadly. This is why money just terrifies me. You go make a billion dollars. I don't want to. It terrifies me. Verse 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. Godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. We brought nothing into the world. We can't take anything out of it. If we have food and covering with these, we'll be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare 
and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction because the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It's not money is the root of all evil. It's the love for money is the root of all kinds of evil. And here's one of the scariest verses in the Bible. Some, by longing for money, have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. It couldn't be more clear. The allurement of money and prosperity has drawn people away from the faith. Demas left the faith because he was in love with this present world. So maybe you look at prestige and you say, well, that's not me. That has no allurement to me whatsoever. What about prosperity? Are you drawn away by riches, enticed by riches? Allurement number three, the allurement of pleasure. Back in chapter 17, uh, Revelation chapter 17, end of verse 4, she has in a gold cup abominations filled with unclean things of her immorality. Whatever pleasure you want, you can get. Come to her and you can have whatever your heart desires. Maybe it's greed, maybe it's money, you want that. Maybe it's just pleasure. Maybe it's physical pleasure, maybe it's immorality, maybe it's uh, anything else, just pleasure. Just you want to be satisfied. Here's my question to you this morning. Do you have a price to sell out? Do you have a place at which you would say, well, if, if a false religious system would give me this, then I would join it. Here's the reality. Satan has really, really deep pockets. He has a lot to offer you. And he'll give you exactly what you want as long as you compromise. So what are we supposed to do with it? First John chapter 2, verse 15, you know it. Do not love the world. Don't love anything in the world because the, the things of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, those are the things that not only don't last, but those are the things that corrupt you and take you away and seduce you and ultimately destroy your soul. Don't love the world. Finally, the allurement of power. We have number one, the allurement of prestige. Number two, the allurement of prosperity. And number three, the allurement of pleasure. Number four, the allurement of power. This is just verse six. You'll have power over people. If you join them, you can kill people and it's okay. If you join them, you're on the side of the victors. Join the false religious system or else you're going to die. And so some people might say, okay, I'll join. I don't want to die. They love their life. Do any of those allurements sound familiar to you? Do any of those allurements of this woman who's existed all the way back in Genesis chapter 10. Do they call to you? Are they appealing to you? Are they seductive to you? Which ones are? I would encourage you to talk about those four allurements today over lunch. Which allurement is most seductive to you? Talk to brothers and sisters who who know how to fight that. But let's end where we began. Why do people settle for a cheap substitute? Satan offers such a poor substitute for God's amazing grace. It's so bad. It's like it says, Noki on the back of it. And you're looking at it going, this is not a Nike beanie. It's such a bad substitute. Why do people fall for it? The answer is because their eyes are blinded to the beauty of Jesus and to all that God offers us through him. They don't see it. They want prestige and they can get it in this life, but the world and all of its desires are passing away. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, but he forfeits his own soul? The beauty of Christ would say, if you just deny yourself in this life, you get a kingdom in the next life. You want prestige? God said his kingdom is not of this world. But if you want the real prestige, it's in the next life. What these people are wanting They're wanting impact and influence. God says, I can give you that in abundance. Use it for my glory. They just don't see it. They want prosperity. They want prosperity, but in a moment, all of their riches will be gone. Bible says, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, thieves break in and steal. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. You don't lose a a dime of it. Don't, Don't go to false religion in order to be wealthy. Go to Jesus with nothing in your pockets, poor in spirit, and he'll give you a kingdom. He'll give you everything. They want pleasure. And sin is pleasurable for a season. That's the only reason why we keep doing it. It's pleasurable. 
But Proverbs says in the end, it brings death. They don't know that. They don't believe that. They don't want to believe that. Instead, if they could only see that as the psalmist says, there are pleasures forevermore at the right hand of God. You want real pleasure? Go to Jesus. Everything else is a substitute, is a, a secondary cheap knockoff pleasure. Don't drink from broken cisterns that hold no water. Drink from the fountain of living water that Jesus says is going to be flowing from his kingdom, from the middle of the kingdom. Go there and you'll enjoy satisfaction forevermore. They want power and they can kill Christians and remain in control. But in the end, though we die, we're never going to die, Jesus says. Though we might die, we will be raised to newness of life and we will never die. And though they might live, they're going to die and then they're going to die again. A second death, the Bible says. Remember, if you're back in Revelation 17, we'll end here. Verse 1, the angel says, Come here and I will show you. Turn to chapter 21, verse 9. The angel says, One of the seven angels who had the seven bulls. And I don't know if this is the same angel. I like to think it's the same angel. Because the angel began in chapter 17 by saying, come and I will show you, come here and I will show you Babylon. This awful economic system, this awful religious system, the system that's destroyed billions of lives. And I think with sorrow in his heart, he says, look at this, look at what this is. And I, I hope it's the same angel that gets to say, say almost identically the same words. Chapter 21, verse nine, one of the seven angels with the seven bulls comes to me and says, come here, same word, and I will show you, same phrase, but this time I'm not showing you Babylon. I'm showing you the bride, the wife of the lamb. My friends, the reason why people settle for a prostitute and not the bride of the lamb is because they don't know how amazing the bride is and how amazing the church is together and most importantly, how amazing Jesus Christ, the bridegroom himself is. That's our job. Brothers and sisters, our job is to go out in the world and say, we get it. We get what sin is. We understand that it's pleasurable for a season. That's why we still struggle with it. But we have found a superior pleasure that can never be taken away. Come to Jesus. Feast on Jesus. That's what he even says with the feeding the 5,000. If you're hungry, come to me and I'll give you, I'll give you bread that'll satisfy your hearts for all of eternity. If you're thirsty, don't just drink water. Drink from me the fountain of living water and fountains will spring up inside of you. Babylon is the direct contrast of the holy city of Jerusalem. And so I would say to you this morning, leave the prostitute behind and be united to the bride. Father, we thank you for your word that is so clear in its application. God, I think about how, how often we are allured and seduced by these four categories that we see here in Revelation 17. But here this morning, we want to defiantly say, no. We want the unmasking of these seductions to happen in our souls so that we would see, even as we partake of communion this morning, we would see Christ and everything that he has to offer. His body, his blood, it's better by far than anything in this world. So Father, as we prepare our hearts now to partake of the bread, to remember your body given for us, broken for us and given to us, may we fight against any allurement of this world by clinging to the superior satisfaction of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We pray in his name. Amen.